to Centennial Baptist Church this morning. What a wonderful day to be uh, able to worship the Lord uh, as we continue to do our Facebook Live and uh, on our website. Uh, so for all of you who are watching us um, out in the internet, I just want to welcome you to church this morning and I hope and pray that you have a wonderful and happy Mother's Day. So Sally, come lead us. All righty, 666, which is a strange number for a hymnal, even though you don't have your hymnals at home. This song is on, uh, anyway, it's we have like come into his they house. Ought to take, you know, they take 13, the 13th floor, they ought to take out that six, number six, out of the <laughs> But look out, devil beware, we've come into his house. thinking about you. God has given you a blessing by giving you children, no matter what you have experienced as a result of them. Your children bring you joy and worry. But today, we just want to say to all the mothers who are, who are watching this today, thank you. And we, we honor you today as we celebrate Mother's Day. Thank you for all the times that you have patched us up when we fell. Thank you for listening to us when we have been broken. Thank you for believing in us. So this morning, as we come to our prayer time, we're going to pray for all of the mothers who are in the sound of this broadcast. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for all of the mothers that are out there today. Lord, I thank you and praise you for... Uh, for the work that they have done in our lives by choosing to have us and give birth to us. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for the way that they raised us, for the decisions that they have made as they have uh, watched us grow. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue to help us and help them to understand how loved and appreciated they are, especially on today, the day that we celebrate our mothers. Lord, I want to lift up those mothers who are out there today who are hurting for various reasons. Lord, sometimes those uh, mothers who are hurting because their children are sick, for their children who have lost their way. Lord, I pray that right now that you would just wrap your arms of love around them and give them a measure of comfort and peace and strength during this time. Lord, we lift up those mothers who have lost children and I just pray for them right now. God, I pray that you would be their strength as, as they remember today. Lord, I ask for your hand to be upon them, to guide them, to give them comfort and hope and peace. Lord, we thank you and praise you 
for the gift that you have given all of us in our mothers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, when we're here all alone, it's a little, you know, I don't want to say boring. It's not boring, but it's different. <laughs> anyway, normally this side would sing part of it, and this side would sing it part of it. Well, we're, Bryce and I are going to try and do it. We're going to do it. We'll do it. We're going to, you know, have a little fun this morning. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. young lady by the name of Lisa Anschutz, who's now married, Lisa Brown, um, she actually came up with this as, a, as our theme song for that year. And so every time we sing this, I go back to my camp days and thinking about how God called me into ministry. And, and so I'm just really excited about that. So anyway, but this is our, this is our theme song. Our, this was our theme song that year for our camp. So. Here I am, Lord. Oh 
The scriptures that I just read were written to the Israelites when they were in captivity. Isaiah prophesied about them being in captivity. And, and Jeremiah um, had, was prophesying about this is going to happen and you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. And at the end of that 70 years, this is what's going to happen. Isaiah and Jeremiah both knew what God was up to. Now, understanding that captivity in a foreign land is no cakewalk. Captivity means being somewhere where you did not want to be. When Nebuchadnezzar led his troops from Babylon to come and take Jerusalem, they destroyed the walls, they destroyed the temple, and they carried off all of the holy articles that they used in their worship of the Lord. Most of those were made out of gold and other precious metals, and so they were valuable to a foreign country that would come in. But not only would they take of the most precious metals and the most precious things that were there um, in the temple and in the palace, but they also took the most precious thing that the land had, and that was its people. They took the people of Israel into captivity. We know the stories of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we know how they were, were ushered into the king's service and how they were used. Many other people were, were asked to use their gifts and their talents and their abilities in the new kingdom, not in Jerusalem any longer, but in Babylon. Jeremiah saw that in a prophecy that God had told him that they would be there for 70 years. In fact, in the scriptures just prior to what I read, Jeremiah told the people that as you are taken into captivity, build houses, plant gardens, plan on being there for a while. Make roots in the place that you are at so that you can serve the Lord well while you're there. While the Israelites were not necessarily slaves, like I said, they could build their houses and they could have gardens and things like that. They were also not allowed to wander off and go back home either. Now we Christians love Isaiah 40, 31. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. And, and very close to that, we love Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. We need to understand that there is application for us today in both of these verses, but the context that they were written in was about the Babylonian captivity. The Israelites were instructed that they should put their hope in the Lord. No matter what the circumstances. In fact, in Isaiah 40, verse 31, uh, many translations, instead of the one I've read, says, Trust in the Lord. Many who put their hope in the Lord will find new strength. The Israelites were instructed that they should put their hope in the Lord no matter what the circumstances. That is true for us today. We. We often stop at verse, third, at verse 11 in Jeremiah. But looking to the next two verses, we see... Excuse me. That cough. The next two verses in Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13 say this. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. The hope that is that is ushered in there. There's a promise that, but there's also a responsibility for us to look to, to God. We are to pray to God. We are to seek Him wholeheartedly. That theme is echoed throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. And that is applicable for us today. And I firmly believe that God, for His people, His chosen people, the Christians today who are there walking on this, this earth at this time, that God's plan for us is to give us hope and a future. To find this hope, we are to pray to God and to seek Him wholeheartedly. We also know that Jesus promised His followers a place in heaven. So therefore, our hope is not on things of this world, but in our future place in heaven with Jesus. 
This hope that we have is not in ourselves, not in our buildings, but in Jesus, who enables us to experience things that people who don't know Jesus cannot experience. This morning, we're talking about that hope, finding some application about what we need to do as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and how our hope should be carrying us through this very time that we are in today. In fact, this morning I'm going to look at um, when we put our hope in the Lord, we experience at least five different results. When we put our hope in the Lord, we will experience at least five different results. Number one, we find peace because of his strength. We find peace not based on our own strength or our own abilities. We find peace because God is strong. Psalm 46 verse 1 through 3 says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earthquakes come and when the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam and let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help. In times of trouble. That was one of my grandmother's favorite verses. That was one of my grandma Hemi. was one of her favorite verses. And I heard her quote that often. Many times. As we were growing up. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. Says this. And Nehemiah continued. Go and celebrate with the re re feast, rich, feast of rich foods. And sweet drinks. And share gifts of, good, of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Do not be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah must have been a Baptist. Must have been a Southern Baptist. Because he told them to drink sweet tea and share their food and have a potluck. Now understand that at this particular point in time, Nehemiah had gone back. And they had built the temple, and now they were rebuilding the walls. And Nehemiah gathered all of the Israelites who had now, the 70 years has passed, they had gathered together at the temple, they had built a platform, and Ezra and Nehemiah had read the word of the Lord. And what happened was after Nehemiah had instructed Ezra to read the word of the Lord, the people had tore their clothes, and they started to mourn. Because they realized how far away they were from God's plan. And Nehemiah said, no, go and celebrate with rich foods and sweet drinks. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah, Nehemiah is telling them to hope in the Lord's strength. That while there was reason for mourning, they needed to rely on the Lord's strength. Even though they had royally messed up, they will find peace in God's strength. I can't help but think that there is application for us today. And while I'm very reluctant to say that certain things are a judgment of God, it is really hard to look at some events and and not come to at least a small conclusion that that is, that is a case. That that is a case. We as individuals need to look at our own lives. We need to look at scripture and evaluate what we think about sin. What we think about following God. And does, it match, does our opinion match up with what God says? And then once we realize, if we realize that maybe our opinion is not where God lines up, we need to adjust our opinion to match with God's word. We don't need to try and bend scripture in order to match our opinion. That is always a recipe for disaster. We need to rely on God's strength. And the Israelites who were there that were starting to mourn at that point in time realized where they were in God's eyes. They realized why they had spent 70 years in captivity and it broke their heart. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. And are safe. Folks, God is the original safe space. We need to rely on him. We are weak. God is strong. 
run to him. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, search for the Lord and for his strength, continually seek him. We need to seek for God, search for his strength. God is stronger than anything in heaven on earth, or heaven or on earth. Relying on that strength will give you peace. We need to rely on God's strength. And when we do, that will give us peace. Number two. Number two, as a result of our hope in the Lord, we find wisdom because of his understanding. We find wisdom because of his understanding. Just as God is stronger than anything in heaven or on earth, God is wiser than anyone on ever, in heaven or on earth. God knows all things past, present, and future, and God is not shocked by what things go on on our planet. COVID-19 did not shock God. He knew it was coming. He knew it was here. It was not a shock to God. Just like when bad things happen in your life, it is not a shock to God when bad things happen. Now understand, I'm not saying that God causes bad things to happen. That is not true at all. Bad things happen on this world as a result of sin. And all of that permutations. There, there was a discussion about the butterfly effect about how a butterfly flaps its wings on one side of the planet and it causes a hurricane somewhere else. Okay, it's kind of a big, huge, convoluted type of thing. However, when you look at it in a result of sin and sickness, those things are a result of sin. Um, and even where we're at today, things are a result of sin. If Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, we would not have sickness on the planet. Right? Now, I'm not blaming them. I mean, we know what happened. Right? I'm not blaming them specifically, but if it hadn't been for sin on earth, we would not have sickness. We would not have death. We would not have, have all kinds of other sins that have cropped up because of that one initial sin. But here's the deal. God knew that was going to happen too. And God had a plan. And that plan was to send Jesus and have Jesus die on the cross to pay for all of those sins. So that those who put their trust in him and follow him will have eternal life. So put your trust in Jesus today and that will give you peace. But number two was we find wisdom because of his understanding. Proverbs chapter two, verse six says, the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. In Isaiah 40, 28, in the passage we read earlier, it says, no one can measure the depths of his understanding. We, we can't measure it. There's no way. We can't give God an IQ test, right? There's just no way. James tells us that if any of us lack wisdom, ask God and he will give it to it. Not because we are smarter, but because God is smarter. If you lack wisdom, if you are struggling with a decision, and I would tell you to do this for whether your decisions are small or large. If you are struggling with decisions, go to the Lord and ask him for wisdom. Ask him for discernment. Every week in the last six or eight weeks, I've been on a pastor's call um, with pastors in our association. Um, and as we continue to walk, walk towards the merger of our association and then Missouri Baptist Association, both associations have been together. And every week as we talk and as we discuss, um, we kind of have this opportunity for prayer requests. And I don't know that a week that has gone by that a pastor hasn't asked for wisdom and discernment for a decision that they have to make in the midst of this, of this pandemic. Folks, I promise you that the pastors in our churches are praying and seeking the Lord for wisdom during this time, trying to figure out what the best course of action is to show love for our community, to show love for our members in our churches. And how do we do that? None of us have walked through this before, I can guarantee you. But we're all praying and we're asking God for discernment and wisdom. Because like I said before, this didn't take God off. It, it didn't shock God. He knew exactly what was going on. So we are seeking him. Well, earlier I said we found peace in God's strength. But we also, number three, we also find strength in when we trust him. So we rest in God's strength. But God also strengthens us when we trust him. 
Isaiah 41.10 says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. When you need the strength to do what needs to be done, trust in God. He will strengthen us and help us. When you need to have that difficult conversation with a friend who's not living the way God wants him to or her, trust in God to give you that strength to do the right thing. And he will give you the strength that you need. When you need to do something, God is calling you to go on mission for him which is something that God calls all of us to do in our own way, in our own context of where we are at. We are all on mission no matter where we are at. But when God calls you to a specific part of that mission, you need to rely on God's strength. You need to trust in the Lord that if he has called you to that place, that you need to follow him. He will give you the strength that you need to do what he's called you to do. Number four is that we can rejoice about the future. We can rejoice about the future. John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3 says, Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Praise the Lord. Preparations are still being made in heaven. They don't have enough places built yet for all the people that are going to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. They are still working. How do I know that? Because scripture right here says so. That when it is all ready, I will come and get you. Heaven is not ready for us yet. That is why Jesus hasn't come yet. And you can rely that when that happens, Jesus will be here to take his church home and to take his followers back to their permanent home, which will be in heaven. When your future is secure, you can rejoice. We here at Centennial Baptist Church and Southern Baptist Churches all over the country, many other, many other places, believe in what we call the security of the believer. That means once you have a personal relationship with Jesus, a true personal relationship with Jesus, and I'm defining that by first you've recognized that your sins separate you from God. Not your, not, not your parents' sins, not your grandparents' sins, not your teacher's sins, not your preacher's sins, but your sins. Once you recognize that your sins have separated you from God, that you have placed your trust in Jesus, his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice, but then his resurrection that we celebrated on Easter just a few weeks ago. You trust in that for your salvation. Not that you can do anything. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot be good enough to earn heaven. But Jesus was. And when he died on the cross. He sacrificed his life for you. That if you put your trust. And faith in him. On that action. You can be saved. Not only do you need to ask for forgiveness of your sins. But you need to repent of your sins. This is a mindset change where you change the way you think about sin. You stop trying to rely on your own opinion about what is sin and what is not sin. You rely on God's word to tell you what is right and what is wrong. And you follow Jesus in that. So in your mind then, the things that you did before you were saved, the sins that you committed, now you should hate those behaviors that you engaged in. You should hate those things now. And you should change your behavior in order to modify. That's what repentance is. It is a change in mindset that changes your actions in what you do. Once you've repented of your sins, you need to commit to follow Jesus every day of your life. So this commitment is not just a, a, a one-time decision. Where you might have walked the aisle in a church, you prayed the prayer. The pastor said, great, you're now saved. And then that act doesn't change you. 
If you are not changed, if you are not any different, even if you walk down the aisle, even if you prayed a prayer with the pastor and he, you, you said that you, yes, I accepted Jesus. But if you haven't changed from that moment, from where you were to where you are today, folks, something didn't happen right. And I don't know that you're truly saved or not. Now, it's not for me to judge, but I know what scripture says. That when you become a Christian, you make God the Lord of your life. That's what I mean when I say you need to follow Christ from that point on. That he is now your boss. He's the one that says what's right and wrong. And you become, you are submissive to God for the rest of your life. Now that's a hard thing to do. And you say, well, you're talking about eternal, eternal, eternal security and security of the believer. Yeah, a believer who's following Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't fall into a sin that you used to do. That's not what I'm talking about. We have it way back when, when I was growing up, we used a term called backsliding. And what that meant was, yeah, you're saved, but you have now, you've kind of fallen into a sin and you need some help now to get out of that. But here's the deal. If you are a backslidden Christian, God is not going to let you go. You are going to be convicted about your sin. You are going to feel guilt and remorse because God isn't letting you go. His spirit is going to be speaking to you. Now you can harden your heart and you can turn away from that. But God is still speaking to you. That is evidence that you are still following God. And I would encourage you, if you're here today and that is where you are at, I would encourage you to go to the Lord in prayer. Repent of whatever sin it is that you are stuck back in and rely on God and then get plugged in to a church that can help you with that. Because obviously when we try and do things on our own, we aren't strong enough by ourselves. We need people around us who will help us stay accountable. We need people around us who will love us even though we're screwing up. And we need people around us who will help us to learn what God wants us to do and then help us to follow that. So that's what I mean. When I talk about a person who is, who is truly saved, they have done that, okay? Once you have done that, no one can take away your salvation. Praise the Lord. No one can take away that from you. And folks, you can't even mess it up with your own sins. But we can rejoice about the future that is waiting for us when our time on earth is done. So first we looked at number one, we find peace because of God's strength. Number two is we find wisdom because of his understanding. Number three is that we find strength when we trust him. Number four is that we can rejoice about the future. And number five is we can rest in the promise of answered prayer. We can rest in the promise of answered prayer. 1 John 5 verses 14 and 15 says that we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. You know, sometimes we have conversations with people about a verse like this. And I had a friend who, uh, he, we were talking, and we were both young, we were both right out of college, or maybe he may have still been in college, but we were talking about a verse like this, and he kind of grew up in more of a little bit of a Pentecostal background than I did. And we were talking about this verse, and, and, and we, we, he talked to you, yeah, God's going to give you anything, whatever it is, you're going to ask for it. If you just have enough faith that God's going to ask you for it. I said, well, we're here at camp. We're in a wilderness camp. Man, I'd really like to have a Big Mac right now. Do you think I could pray and ask God to give me a Big Mac and he'd give it to me? He said, yeah, if you got enough faith, God's going to give you a Big Mac. Okay. And then I read this verse a little bit closer because it says, and we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Now I'm saying nothing. I, my, listen, my cousin runs the McDonald's. I have absolutely, I'm not nothing against McDonald's, but what I'm saying is this, when we ask something that pleases God, if you're out in the wilderness and you're asking for a Big Mac, it's because you're being selfish, right? I mean, it's because you're being selfish. If you are in a, um, if you are starving and you ask for food, that is not being selfish, right? 
So if you are in a different situation, the different context that you are in tells you know, what is going to please God, right? So we need to pray, and anything that pleases God, he's going to say yes. So we, in order for our prayer life to be completely, um, to, to work the way we hope that it will, we need to be in the will of God. We need to be walking with God daily. We need to spend time in the Word. We need to spend time with other believers. We need to spend time just praying to God, asking Him for wisdom, asking Him for discernment. And then when we ask for things that God has already promised us, wisdom and discernment, things that God has promised us, when we ask Him for those things, then He will lay these things on our heart that we need to be praying for and asking for. One thing that always pleases God is when we pray for the salvation of people that we know. We pray for people that we know to grow in their faith. When we pray for people that we know that maybe have backslidden a little bit or maybe who, have, who are struggling in, a, in an area of their walk with God somewhere. So when we pray for those people that are struggling with that, then, then we know that we are pleasing God. So I want to encourage you today, find some people that you know that don't know Jesus, that don't follow him. Maybe that have fallen away, pray for them by name. Every day, pray for them. We can rest in the promise of answered prayer. John 15, verse 7. Again, it's the same kind of context. John wrote both of these. He says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Once again, you go back to your relationship with God will lead you to praying for things that God wants you to ask him for. That is a whole different idea of praying for everything that you're just going to have granted, right? Pray, if you remain in me, if you remain in Jesus, and Jesus' words remain in you, I'd encourage you also, not only do I encourage you just to spend time in the Word, I encourage you to pray for people specifically by name every single day. I also encourage you to read the Gospels once a year. Just spend time. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read the Gospels every year. Why? Because Jesus said right here, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Well, where do you find out about Jesus? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? So, if we're going to remain in Jesus' words, we need to remain in those Gospels. Now, I recommend you read the whole New Testament once a year. And I recommend that you read the Old Testament some as much as you want. Um, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in the Old Testament. I love the history. I love the stories. Um, but I, I would just encourage you to read. And if you're going to struggle with reading like the whole Bible in a year, focus on the Gospels, focus on the New Testament. Um, now, if you're an avid reader and, and reading all of that is not a big problem for you, man, read the whole thing. Read it every year. It's awesome. Uh, I want to encourage you to do that. But if you struggle with reading, um, do that. Also, hey, man, there's an awesome app that you can get on your phones or on your computer. Um, Uversion is an app that you can get on your smartphone. And it has all kinds of Bible translations. Um, and so you pick your favorite translation. Like I said, I preach out of the New Living because of the, the, the current level of people's language, right? Uh, and so that's why I use that one. But if I'm reading or if I'm listening to it or studying it, there's other translations that I like as well. The New American Standard is what I studied in seminary as far as using that one because it was a really literal translation. Um, I like that. And now there's a couple others that are out there that are more current than those. Uh, the ESV, the English Standard Version. Uh, the CSB is the Christian Standard Bible. Um, and those are also really good. And I know some people just love the poetic way that the King James reads. And that's fine if you have a dictionary with you when you listen to it because you're going to need it. Um, but that being said, on you version, you can listen to many of those translations. So hook your phone up to some headphones. And if you don't want to read, on your walks, just listen to God's Word. That is so awesome. Um, now, I will tell you this. As I'm listening to God's Word, sometimes I don't catch all of it. But you know what? I catch a lot of it. So anyway, I want to encourage you to do that. So we can rest in the promise of answered prayer. In our text today, Jeremiah said this. In those days, when you pray, I will listen. Remember what we were talking about. We're talking about the future captivity that the Israelites were going to experience. Jeremiah said, in those days when you pray, I will listen. This is an awesome promise. 
that we can go to God with anything that's going on in our life, He will hear and He will listen. We need hope in the Lord. We need hope in all of those things that He can do for us. I'm going to have a video here in just a moment as, as Mary gets it queued up and we get it focused in on with the, with the video. Um, Mary, go ahead anytime you're ready. How we gather has changed. But our calling is not. We are still on mission. We are still commanded to make disciples. To love our neighbor. To give of our time. And our resources. We are still the body of Christ. Called to be a light. The world and the Mexico deserve. A city on a hill. Which could not be hit. Declaring the hope of Jesus. Boldly stand on the power of our risen Savior and answer our calling. We are called to work in our community to show that the body of Christ is still here and still active. Our community. Our country needs hope right now. When we see the things that need to change, we need to step up and be Jesus. We need to be Jesus for the hurting. We need to be Jesus for the weak. We need to be Jesus for the sick. We need to be Jesus for the persecuted. We need to be Jesus for the hungry. We need to be Jesus for those who are targeted because of the color of their skin. We need to be Jesus for those who struggle with alcohol and drugs. We need to be Jesus for those who are enslaved in sex trade. We need to be Jesus for those who are living in fear because of the coronavirus. We need to be Jesus to those who are mentally broken because they are laid off from work and don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Our community needs hope. Our community needs Jesus, which is where our hope comes from. We need to be the leader in hope for people. We need to take our faith in Jesus and be real with people about it. Share your faith with Jesus with others. They need it now more than ever. Are you ready to do that? Church, are you ready to do that? Are you ready to be the church that Jesus envisioned? Are you ready to get outside of the four walls that we have with the church and do missions? Are you ready to share your faith with others? I've put a link on our Facebook page and our website to the Who's Your One virtual tour. We started the Who's Your One campaign here at our church after the Southern Baptist Convention last year. And their intention was to go to all these different locations and have a conference. But because of the coronavirus, all their dates got scrubbed and they can't do that. However, they brought their speakers to videos and they put them on for us. And so there's a link on our Facebook page. Um, after we post this, I will put the link at the bottom of this page in the comments section. Um, and it, will, it is also on our website, Who's Your One Virtual Tour. You can either watch it all at one time, or they've also broken it down into five videos. Um, and I want to encourage you. Say, so Pastor Bryce, I can't share my faith with someone. Well, you know what? There's fear in all of us in doing that. But these tools can help you 
to be able to do that. And that will help you gain confidence in sharing your faith with others. As we close this morning, if you're hearing this and you've lost your hope, I encourage you to reach out to us. Jesus wants you to have hope. Jesus will give you that hope. Are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to give you hope? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we know that there's a lot of people that are out in our community and in our world that have no hope. They're struggling with what to do. They're struggling with how to do it. Lord, as we've had have opportunities to share our love of you with people around. I pray that you would just give us wisdom and knowledge as a church to know the best ways to do that. Lord, I thank you and praise you for the work that you do. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your willing sacrifice on a cross so that we would not have to live with the consequences of our sin, but that we could find hope in you. We could have hope in our future and spend an eternity in heaven with a God who loved us so much he was not willing to allow ourselves to get in our way of spending eternity with him. Thank you for providing a way for us to receive you and have this hope. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're hearing this today, I want to encourage you, if you are lacking hope because of any reason, maybe you have, maybe you have a physical need that you need met right now. You don't know where you can find help with that. Reach out to us on Messenger. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about what we can do to help. If you are out there and you are needing, um, just needing hope because you are kind of losing your mind in all of this, we'd be happy to talk with you and pray with you about whatever it is that you're going through. I just want you to know that, you know, we at Centennial Baptist Church, we love our community. We love Mexico, Missouri. We love the people who are here. And we know that God loves you too. And if we can be a way to, um, if we can be a conduit in any way to show God's love to you, we want that opportunity. So please reach out to us. You can reach out to me, Bryce Christofferson. I'm on Facebook. You can find me and message me. I will, I will get that um, if you want. I think my number is on our website as well. Um, you can get to my phone number and text me there as well. Um, or you can send an email through our website to the church, and we'd be happy to answer that as well. So anyway, thank you. We're going to close with a, uh, with a song for In His Presence. Oh,
folks to watch us on Facebook and uh, like and share the sermon as it's posted um, so that other people will have an opportunity to see it. That'll go out to all your friends if you like and share it. God bless you and have a wonderful week.